You may be seated. Amen. Um, yeah, praise the Lord. Amy, thank you for, for praying that. I feel like maybe even the purpose that, that God called us together this morning is just that we would lift up a heart cry and say, Lord, you're worthy of it all. And, and we want to, again, just commit our all before you. And so, so amen. Hey, um, so how we're going to do this teaching time this morning is a little bit of a mashup of three of us sharing uh, just some of the purposes and values of, of who we are and what we care about and what we want to be as churches and what we want to be as individuals. It's a great time of the year to do that, by the way. Um, in the new year, in the first Sunday of the new year, it's a great time to say, hey, Lord, would you do sort of a spiritual reset in our lives and reset us, recenter us on on what you care about and what you value and what you want for each of us. And so and so that's what we're that's what we're gonna do. And and when we talk about um what we value and what is important, in writing there's a way that we kinda set that uh, kinda set that apart. We do that with punctuation marks, don't we? Uh this last summer um I did a little bit of writing and um, as I was writing, I had this editor who was working with me, and he was looking at some of my writing and saying, hey, David, you can't use that many exclamation points. You can't be passionate about everything. You can't, like, be excited about everything. And he would hand back a page to me, and he would circle all the exclamation points and say, you need to stop it. You can have one. And I'd be like, one? I'm about, like, I love all. And he'd be like, you can have one. And um, what I had to learn is that if there is something that I am ultimately passionate about, that I want to set like aside as ultimate value, I can use an exclamation point. And um, some of you know this, but biblically, in the biblical mindset, they didn't use punctuation marks. But the way that you set something apart or show value or importance is through repetition. Okay, so there were times where Jesus was teaching, and, and he would pause, and he would say, truly, truly, I say unto you. And when Jesus would drop like a double truly, when he emphasized, it's like an exclamation point from Jesus, like pause and listen closely to what Jesus has to say, okay? And there, there is a place in the Bible. In fact, if you have your Bibles with you, which I hope you do, why don't you open up to the last book, Revelation chapter 4. And let me just kind of set up a scene that is just um, amazing. It's amazing. We were just singing this scene. And let me just kind of set up what's happening in Revelation chapter 4. If you'd picture this with me, um, this apostle, this follower of Jesus named John, was given a glimpse into ultimate reality, Okay. It's like heaven was peeled open and for a moment John got to see that which truly is and that which is truly to come. And John was given a vision of the throne of God, okay? And this is the kind of vision that, that knocked him on his face. It would have knocked you on your faces too because John looked up and he saw this throne in heaven and this throne was, was like made of fire and it was peeling out like lightning and thunder and fire just shooting out of this throne and on the throne was God and surrounding this throne were 24 little thrones with these elders wearing crowns and around these 24 elders and the throne in the middle there were actually these four living creatures I don't know how to describe this but they were covered with eyes they could always see and they were symbolically represented different things but it wasn't so much uh, what they saw, but what they said, okay? There was something that, that brought a certain words to their lips. And remember, biblically, if you want to say it's of ultimate importance or value, you repeat something twice. But watch what happens in this place in Scripture. Revelation 4, uh, verse 8. Let me just read it to us. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And what's meant to just sort of jump off the page to us is that something is not only said, not only repeated, but it's said three times, 
there is this emphatic, like, like this emphatic, um, academically it's called a Semitic emphatic, which just means it is so important that it can't be put to words, that they're just saying, God, you're worthy of it all. You're, you're holy, which means to be set apart of ultimate value and worth. And they're just saying it over and over and over. They never cease to say it. Look back at the text. They repeat it, holy, 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 and they never cease to repeat it, okay? And so let me just, let me just make a point that I, I hope it's obvious. I hope we don't even necessarily need to say it, but I want to say it anyways, okay? Because this is the kind of son and daughter that God would have us to be, the kind of churches that God would want us to be. And we're going to say that it's a value here that we're not going to compromise and we're going to have forever. In fact, in fact, we're going to put it as an up arrow and say that this will be a directional reach of our church forever. Okay, here it is. You know it, but here it is. We want to be about the Lord. We want to say that if, if he is the one that is ultimately set apart and worthy of it all and, and so worthy, so holy that there's angels around the throne and creatures around the throne, and we'll see later, tens of thousands around the throne just calling out, you're set apart, you're holy, you're worthy, it's ultimately all about you. We want to be a church that's ultimately all about him. And one day, uh, Scripture tells us there will be a moment where every knee will bow, tongue will confess, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth will just call out and say, you are the only one that matters, okay? It's all, it's all about you. And so we want to be a church that says that too, that says, God, we care more about what you value and what offends you and what makes you feel uncomfortable and what you love than we do. And, and let me just clarify because um, a lot of ministry philosophy is different in this day and age. We care more about that than saying, what do we care about? What makes us uncomfortable? What offends us? Because we want to craft the perfect church where it's all about us. We don't want that. We want it to be about the Lord, okay? We want it to be about God. He is the one that is holy, holy, holy. Amen? Are we all on the same page? Okay, so there is a first directional arrow of this church and the kind of churches that we want to be where we say it's all about him. And by the way, so for most of my life, um, I have thought and taught um, that this is the only place in Scripture where three words are said because it's of the ultimate. I think one day I'm going to realize, I'm so sorry, all the things I taught wrong over the years. So, so I love you all. I'm sorry for that. Um, but I've always been like, this is the one place in all of Scripture where three times, holy, holy, holy. But uh, just two weeks ago, I came across another place. Okay, so I was, I was uh, in December, um, I restarted doing a one-year Bible. Okay, and by the way, that is just something that has been great for my heart to have some kind of plan of how to meet with the Lord through his word. And I just want to kind of on the side, kind of parenthesis on the side, say um, this is a great time, January 2nd, to reevaluate, hey, how are you going to meet with the Lord through his word this year? How are you going to set him apart as holy, holy, holy this year? And so some guys that I do life with all yesterday, we were texting back and forth and saying, some of them were like, I'm going to do the New Testament in one year, or I'm going to do this plan, or I'm going to do it on the Bible app. I just want to lovingly say, pray about what you will do this year. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to do the one-year Bible this year, and I'm not going to be really like rigid or legalistic. If I miss a couple days each week, it's okay, but I'm going to try to systematically try to read the entire Bible because I see things that I've never seen before. Okay, so a few weeks ago, um, I was reading in the book of Daniel, and I came to Daniel chapter 7. And actually, actually, why don't you go ahead and turn there. Daniel chapter 7. And I saw another scene very similar to this John scene. And I'd actually never realized this verse before. Okay? Daniel is also given a vision of ultimate reality. Daniel is also given this picture of what is to come. And he also sees the throne of God. And on the throne of God is God, and his name is is the Ancient of Days. That's what they call him. Isn't that beautiful? 
God is called the Ancient of Days, okay? And there is fire shooting out of the throne. And there are 10,000 times 10,000 people around the throne. And if some of you know this amazing chapter in the Bible, all of a sudden Daniel is looking and coming with the clouds of heaven, there is one called the Son of Man, okay? So Son of Man, who is ultimately known as Jesus, right? comes on the clouds of heaven, comes before the Ancient of Days, and it says that all tribes, nations, peoples will bow before him as king. He is given a dominion and a kingdom that will last forever and never end, okay? And then so I want you to see this. This is Daniel chapter 7, verse 18, okay? I love this verse. Daniel chapter 7, verse 18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Okay? In Hebrew, olam, 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 which is a Hebrew word which just means forever. Okay? So there is God on a throne surrounded by 10,000 times 10,000. There is Jesus coming on the clouds of heaven with his kingdom, and he gives to his children, to the saints of the Most High, a kingdom. And he says, and by the way, I want something to be known about this kingdom, okay? It will last forever, 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 okay? And that was stunning to me. That the kingdom of God that we get to be a part of, that we get to walk in, is a kingdom amidst a world. And I don't know how you kind of assess our world right now, but when I look around, I see a lot of things as very temporary and very fading, okay? Our cultural moment is temporary and fading, though it's painful. Our bodies, some of you know this, they're, they're temporary and they're fading and they're aging. Can I get an Amen. All right, our, our lives, what we value, our possessions, they're temporary and they're fading, okay? But I just want to point this out biblically because it's amazing to me. I just want to recenter us on God's character and God's kingdom. God's character is holy, holy, holy. His kingdom is forever, forever, forever. His character is triple exclamation points. His kingdom is triple exclamation points. And I want to be a man of God as I begin this new year that says, God, I am going to focus on, be worried less about the things that are temporary and fading. Center my heart on your character and your kingdom for it is holy, holy, holy and forever, forever, forever. And I want to be a church like that. I want to be churches like that. That his character and his kingdom is what we ultimately care about, okay? That's what we're going to be. And so my time is, is almost done, and our first arrow is almost done. But um, I just want to tell us very specifically um, what we are entering into for the next 21 days, and I want to invite you to join us in something, okay? And, and this is also kind of coming out of the book of Daniel, and I want to talk about what we are going to do for the next 21 days. So flip over to Daniel chapter 10. Um, and let me just briefly talk about this and invite you into something. Okay, Daniel had this vision of the Lord and he was wrecked by it, okay? And Daniel had some subsequent visions of God, of who he is and what he's doing, and he was further wrecked by it, okay? And he was troubled as he was saying, God, I see what you're doing now and I see the future, and I'm setting my heart now to, to humble myself and to understand you. Okay, and so Daniel said, I want to know you deeper. I want to encounter you. I want to have a spiritual reset. And so he said, therefore, I'm going to enter 21 days of fasting. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that in one second. Let's read Daniel chapter 10, verses 2 through 3. In those days I, Daniel was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. Okay, so look at me. Here's what Daniel said. He's like, I want to encounter the Lord. I want to go after the Lord, okay? And so there are certain foods that I am going to withhold from so I can focus heart, soul, mind totally on God. I'm going to go without sugar, meat, and alcohol for three weeks, 
and I will go after the Lord. And after those 21 days, um, an angel of the Lord came to him. All right? And I want to show you what the angel of the Lord said, Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Okay? Daniel 10, verse 12. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. I just want you to see a man named Daniel who said, I'm going to humble myself before God. I'm going to set my heart to understand God. And I'm going to have a, a spiritual discipline where for 21 days my life is going to look a little bit different. I'm going to actually go into a period of fasting saying, God, would you lessen my appetite and passion for certain things of this world because I want to go after you. Okay, so here's, here's what we're going to do. January 3rd through 24th, if any of you want to join us, we are going to enter, and as I'm about to say this, please hear this right out of the gates, there is all kinds of freedom for how you might want to join us in this thing where we're going to go after the Lord for 21 days, okay? We're going to do something called a 21-day fast. Now, what's a fast, okay? Biblically, technically, a fast is when you say, I am going to withhold food or certain foods for a period of time. And with those hungers, with those longings, I'm going to use it as a reminder to go after the Lord, to seek his face, to humble him, to humble ourselves before the Lord. Okay, so all kinds of freedom for how you might want to join us in this. Um, for some people, they've looked at this and have said, and a lot of people in our church are going to do this, I want to do a Daniel-like fast. Daniel said, I'm going to go without sugar, meat, and alcohol for 21 days. I'm going to go after that. And for some people in this room, they're saying, I want to do it Daniel style and do it like that. Okay? And if so, um, we think that's awesome. And we've seen God meet people in powerful ways when they do that. Let me tell you just personally, my family tried that these last two years. And during a time where the focus was meant to be less on food, it actually... Like, for us, it was so hard that the focus became more on food as we tried to go on this sort of vegetarian kind of thing, and we just, we just got so focused on it that we felt like it was counterproductive, okay? So for us, we're not going to actually do it like that, okay? Some people have said, and, and I think this is an awesome approach too, to say during these 21 days, I want to fast a meal a day. And during that meal a day where I would usually eat, I'm going to just go after the Lord and and humble myself, and use that time and even those hunger pains to seek the Lord, okay? And by the way, during these 21 days, we will have a prayer meeting. I don't know if you know this, by the way, but for over a year now, there has been a prayer meeting that meets at noon every single day, okay, over at the church office. And during these 21 days, we would love to invite you, if you haven't been a part of that, to, to come at lunchtime and seek the Lord with us um, over in the church office. When we overflow the church office, we go to the roots room. Sometimes we've had to go to this room. Okay, we want to invite you into that. Okay, for some of you, you may not want to join us on a fast, but you may say, and please look at me, I think every person in this room could at least do this. For these 21 days, I want to withhold something in my life that, that takes a distracting form where my passion, where my, where my uh, focus, where my like, life goes to, and I want to withhold from that to go after the Lord. So for some of you, many people have said, hey, social media or media or TV on like in the background, like those are things that cause me certain worry or certain comparison or certain kind of anchoring my heart to like things of this world. And for 21 days, maybe we want to go without TikTok. Josh, you don't have to do that. But for the rest of us, maybe like 21 days of, of social media free, okay? So I just want to challenge you to be thinking about that, praying about that. And tomorrow, we're going to go into this Daniel kind of like moment of saying, we want to seek the Lord. What would God have you withhold? Is God calling you to fast with us? For some of us, it's a strong 21-day fast. But we want to be people that seek his character and his kingdom. Let me pray for us, and then Jeff is going to give us um, our second major value. Lord, we love you. We come to you. Your character and your kingdom are forever and never ending. We want to set you apart. We want to be people that go after you. 
um, that go after you with our hearts and souls. We want you to be the center of our church, Lord. Would you do that? Would you be the center of all we do and say we love you? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, David. I love what David said, uh, that when we, when we are passionate about Jesus, that we focus on his character and kingdom. What a way to kind of set up this new year for us. Happy New Year, by the way. I don't know if that's been said so far in the service. It's 2022. My name's Jeff Snyder. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm one of the pastors at Antioch. And uh, as has already been said, it's always so wonderful together as a family of churches. It warms my heart to see Faith Leaper walk in the hallways of my church and all you other gathering folks out here that have joined us this morning. It's really good to see you. Uh, and I, so David was talking about Up being a church that desires to know the Lord fully. And, and I think such a natural overflow of being passionate about knowing Jesus is wanting others to know him too. So I think that leads so naturally into talking about our out arrow which is basically saying, we want to be churches that know Christ up and make him known. We want to reach out to the world around us. This is so important for our family of churches that it's kind of like one of our foundational main arrows that we think about and talk about. And I thought a great place in scripture to look to challenge ourselves and learn for this new year about what reaching out looks like is our church's namesake, the church at Antioch. So if you have your uh, Bible with me, will you turn to Acts 13, and we're going to read about the church that we are named after, the church at Antioch. In this text in Acts, Paul and Barnabas are on a missionary journey. If you look at the top of the chapter, you would notice that they're being sent out on a missionary journey from the church at Antioch. And as we work our way down the chapter, they come to another city called Antioch in the ancient world, and there in this city... Word is getting out about the good news that Paul and Barnabas are sharing. Interest is growing, and so is opposition. And we're going we're gonna to pick up the story of what Paul and Barnabas are doing right there in verse 44. So why don't you read Acts 13, 44 with me? The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. I think there's two things to point out from those verses that are important for the context of what we're talking about and are going to be important for what's coming next. First, interest was growing. There, there was a genuine hunger among the people to hear more of the good news that Paul and Barnabas were preaching. Look at verse 40, 44. It says, The next Sabbath almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But it wasn't just interest that was growing, it was opposition growing too, right? In verse 45, it says the Jews were filled with jealousy and began to contradict them and began to revile them. So opposition and reaction and persecution were growing at the same time. And if we're honest, is that that different than what we're living in today? Even though headlines might tell you that cultural Christianity is fading, I would argue that there is a growing interest in a real, genuine, passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. Like, people want to know Jesus when it's for real. And at that same time, I don't have to tell you that persecu persecution and opposition are growing at the same time here today. And so I think it's important to look at what Paul and Barnabas did in the middle of this time. And look what they say in verse 47 in that same chapter. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. In the middle of this time of growing interest, also faced with growing persecution, what do they do? Do they shrink back and like make their message palatable and like, okay, we don't want to offend anyone? No, they stand up and say, God has commanded us to bring a message of salvation to the world. He's commanded us to be a light 
in the darkness. And even though we're 2,000 years later, I don't believe that the, the heart of God has changed for us. I think he's calling us to stand up and be lights in the darkness. As churches, to be lights. As individuals, to shine the love of God to the world. That's why if you've been with us, it's been such an encouraging time for our family of churches. If you've been with us if we've, as we've released this documentary and book we released in 2021, I don't know if you've noticed, but the image for both of those is a lighthouse. Because we're saying, like, we, we truly believe that God has called us into this unique niche where we can shine the love and light and hope of God to the YMCA. And we want to be a lighthouse shining out that love. And man, hopefully, we've been trying to share stories with you of how it's been received. And the favor of the Lord has just been on it in a way that we can't logically explain. I could stand up here and share stories and stats with you for 15 minutes about all the responses and reactions we've been getting, but I, I don't want to stay here until 11 o'clock for this service and go right into the next one. So I'm just going to share with you one quote. This is a quote we just received like two or three days ago, and it's from a board member in a YMCA in Wisconsin, and this is what he said. He said, I've, I've read 68 pages of The Shining Light and already feel the need to start from the beginning so I can highlight and retain what I'm reading. I find I have to take a break reading too much at one time because my brain goes into overload on the opportunity before us in kingdom building, contemplating the positive impacts of one person at a time through 14,000 plus YMCAs. The impact is beyond my comprehension. There are so many dots ready to be connected. Can we leverage what George Williams, that's the founder of the YMCA, can we leverage what George Williams started? We've heard stories like this over and over again for the past few months. And I just want to say, thank you for being the kind of church that partners with us in this. Like, I, I just feel like as churches, we've been living into this call that we feel like God's leading us in. And, and God is, is, is moving it. It's not us. God's moving the needle. And we just want to give him the glory and say, thank you for being with us. But this out arrow that we're talking about, it's not just a church-wide thing, right? It's not just us as churches shining as a light in the YMCA, but it's a command for each of us as followers of Jesus as well. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, and that was a command to each of us. And it's not always easy, right? If you're anything like me, honestly, like the churchy word would be personal evangelism, is one of the most challenging things for me. It feels clunky sometimes and awkward and personal. Even more so in the culture that we live in today. But that doesn't change the fact that like Jesus calls us to it. And people in the darkness that we're living in right now, they need the light and love and peace offered by Jesus through the Holy Spirit. I love what Paul says in Romans 10, this is what I always come back to to challenge myself and spur myself on. I would encourage you if you have your Bible to turn there and highlight it or write these, this scripture reference down. Uh, Paul says, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. I love how logically Paul lays this out as he's talking. He's like, okay, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on the person they, they don't believe in? And how can they believe in the one who, of whom they haven't even heard? And how can they hear unless someone tells them? It's like churches, as followers of Jesus, our mission is to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. 
to tell another person about the life of Jesus. In the middle of growing persecution and interest, we're called to share with others. And it's not easy, but it's what Jesus calls us to. If, if we are overflowing with the up arrow love or for God's character and kingdom, the natural overflow is talking about it all the time or showing it with our lives. And that's what Paul and Barnabas did in Acts 13. And so I want to look back at how, how that story ends in Acts 13, 48, when Paul and Barnabas got up and said, we're called to be a light to the world. The next verse, it says, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. Many believed. It would be easy to say like, well, yeah, that was for Paul. Like Paul was like a super gifted writer and evangelist. So like, of course. But as we saw in Romans 10, this is a call for each of us to share the good news of the life of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection with others. This is the out arrow we want to call our churches to lean into in this next year. And if, if we will like take a moment to be honest, I just want to be, whenever we teach, I want to be practical and real and honest. I would assume if you're anything like me, it's very either hard or you just kind of forget about it. Like you go to work and or you do your eight to five or your kids wake up in the morning and you take them to school and, and then it kind of like drifts off into the back of your mind. So I want to challenge us this year to start small. I'm such a task-oriented person that usually when I set goals, I set like 15 of them and achieve like half of one of them. So I would say, man, in 2022, what would it look like for you to set a goal of just saying, what if there's one person that I could just pray for and share the good news of Jesus Christ with this year? In 2022, 364 days, because we're on the second day. What would it look like to say, I'm going to pray for this person, I'm going to reach out to this person, I'm going to serve them, I'm going to share the good news of Jesus Christ with my words and with my actions to them. And that's what I want you to think on. We're going to have time later in this service to take communion and reflect a little bit. And I would challenge you to pray and ask that question to the Lord. Who is one person that he is leading you to share the life and love of Jesus with in 2022? And as you consider that, I actually want you to do this. I want you to consider that and ask the Lord. And if you bring someone to mind, I want you to write that name down in a reminder on your phone or somewhere where you will see it. And then just start praying for opportunities to serve and share with that person. And just take a small step in reaching out in this next year. That's how I would close, is, is to say, what would it be like to be churches full of people just praying that people would come to know the Lord and reaching out to one other person, just one? And I would just pray that the Lord, because we can only do it with his strength and his wisdom and his guidance. It's not on our own strategy and logic. And I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna pray that over us as I close, that he would just lead us as we reach out in the YMCA as churches, and as we reach out to others with the good news of Jesus Christ individually. And Mike Newman's going to come up and close us out with our in arrow. Let's pray. Lord, we, uh, we just love you. And as we read those passages from Revelation and Daniel that say you are holy, 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 and your kingdom lasts forever, forever, and ever I would just repeat with what Amy was saying earlier, that we sign up to follow you. We just commit. We want to live our lives, uh, like the good and the ugly of our lives. We just submit them to you and say, make us more like you in a way that, that we would just so naturally radiate your light and love to people around us, Lord. Give us the strength to do that. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeffrey Snyder. Greetings. Great to be back. Last time we saw each other was Baptism Sunday, when I remember this brother over here got baptized. Remember that? That was awesome. That's right. Line of the, the morning that day was, was uh, what's your name? Jack. Jack. They go, Jack, are you ready to follow Jesus? And he goes, you guys remember this? 10,000%. <laughs> That was a great moment. That was a great moment. Love it. Hey, so just in summary, when you go home and you're, you're reflecting and looking towards the year, um, if you would just remember these symbols, they're so easy to remember, and they just are great conversation starters. The up, hey, how am I doing with the Lord, and how can I grow in my relationship with Him? The out, hey, is there anyone that the Lord's put in my life that uh, I need to bring the love of Jesus to? And then uh, my role this morning is to share about the in arrow. And a great question would be, hey, Lord, how, how can I lean into my church? How can I grow in Christ in community? Other relationships that are in front of me, how can I love uh, them and love the Lord at the same time? So that's where we're headed. But especially this morning, um, just talking with the staff and praying about um, what uh, he would have for his uh, church this morning. We're going to focus on the value of the local church but in particular, the value of what we're doing right now, the formal assembly of God's people, um, what I grew up as a kid calling big church. So we're going to talk about just big church for a few moments. Are you ready? Let's do it. So here's a few questions um, that I, I, think, I think if I ask them in this way, they'll hit most everyone in this room. So some of you might be thinking, hey, Lord, um, as I begin this new year, in what ways um, can I grow as a Christian? And then also in what ways can my church grow? Not just in breadth numerically, but in depth. How can we grow as a church? You might be thinking great thoughts of vision, and that, and that might be very like inspiring for you and like exciting. How can I grow? Uh, the other part or the other like portion of people might be looking into this year and going, how in the world am I going to make it this year? I am so depressed, exhausted, tired. I just, I am hanging on for dear life. How am I going to do up in and out? Like, Lord, you're going to have to, I just don't even know, right? So whether you're like excited to grow or you're like totally afraid and and nervous about this coming year, there's one passage that, um, that we felt would be a good passage to remind us on. This is not going to be earth-shattering. Uh, I don't think the rafters will start shaking. This actually might even not be new to you, but it'd be good to remind us of what God loves when the local church gathers. So, um, if you would in your Bible, turn with me to Hebrews 10. And I'll be reading verse 23 through 25. This is the word of the Lord. It says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Isn't that a great passage? These, these few verses really have been the hot verses and, and the verses that we've wondered about when our churches have gone through this COVID period, right? We've all kind of been like, how are we going like, to not neglect meeting with one another when we're not supposed to meet with each other? We've like grappled with that and wrestled through it. And, um, and it's been a, a good process for us all. Uh, John, in his, uh, in his letter, 2 John, he says, Hey, I long to you. I, hey, I'm writing you all these letters, but I especially want to see you. Does anyone know it? Face to face. Like, we've, we've done the whole online thing, and we've all felt empty at the end of it going, This isn't right. 
This is not how it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to see the people of God face to face. And even though, like, I mean, I liked preaching in my, like, slippers those couple Sundays and things like that, um, it is God-honoring to meet with God's people and give Him glory. Amen? At the gathering, we sometimes laugh. We say, if it's virch, it's not church. And that is true. That is true. So the question would be, so if we are to grow, if we are to be sustained, if we're to be like held together, as the scriptures just said, how do we do that? Like what's that supposed to look like? So let's look at that verse again, verse 24, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. So hey friends, the Lord, he's given us a few things. He's given the church a few things to allow us to be stirred towards love and affection when we gather together. Hopefully this will give you context and some, uh, some, some understanding of why we do the things that we do when we come together. Uh, theologians of the past call these things that God has given us uh, tools of common grace, things that we're supposed to do that are not just check in the box, but really provide us with the fuel where the end result is love and good deeds. Okay, so here's a couple coming your way. Ready? The first one is the preaching of God's Word. Paul tells Timothy to preach the Word to his people. Something special happens when someone stands behind this wooden piece and proclaims the words of God and applies it to God's people. There's something special that happens. It's, it's amazing. It goes forth. It says that God's word never returns void. It's powerful. It's sufficient for life and godliness. It goes out from here and it somehow enters into your ears and goes down the 18 inches of your heart and plants a seed that stays. It's incredible. It works. It, it's efficient and efficacious, they say. There's a, a special nature to the word being proclaimed in a public setting in the local church. Wouldn't it be crazy if we all, like, even met in the same room, wore our AirPods, and all listened to different sermons? Wouldn't that be just bonkers? Like, God loves it when one person stands up and delivers the same message for all to hear. There's an accountability factor that takes place, and there's like fire that occurs when everyone hears the same message and receives it in a humble manner. What's cool is that Paul doesn't just say, hey, just just preach the word just because it's nice, or like, because you should do it, or um, preach because there's nothing better to do he really did believe that God's word sustains God's people. Uh, in, in his book, or in his letter to Timothy, in 2 Timothy, he tells him that the Bible, God's word, goes out and it trains you for righteousness. The next time in that book, he uses the same phrase. In chapter 4, he says, hey, and this word will actually help you get a crown of righteousness. That's the next time that phrase is used, of righteousness. And then, he's like, this is like his swan song. He's writing it to Timothy, and he's in prison, and he's really cold, and he makes a couple requests right at the end. So he goes, hey, bring me my cloak. I'm really cold. But more than that, like if you have to like run out of your house and grab a couple things, more than anything, I want to endure. I want to finish strong, so bring me the parchments, he says. Which is, which is a fancy way to say, like, hey, bring me the scrolls. Hey, I'm dying here. Yeah, 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 I'm cold and stuff, so bring me a coat. But I want to read the Bible. It's going to endure me. It's going to sustain me. Hey, people of God, in 2022... Be sustained. Be tethered to Christ closely. How are you going to do that? 
continue to gather with God's people and sit under God's word. Amen? That's one of his common graces. Here's another one. The singing of God's people. Ephesians tells you and tells me to sing to one another with spiritual hymns and songs of praise. Isn't that crazy? Not to stand in isolation like you're in this like telephone booth alone, but it says to sing to one another because it will encourage and edify and build one another up. So yes, you can sing in your cars. Yes, you can like be running with your AirPods and like sing to the Lord a new song. You can do that. Husbands, you can sing in the showers, even though your wives like might not like that, okay? But there is something special when the church gathers together in person and sings songs to the Lord and to one another. There's nothing like it. They, like, they all sing the same thing. They all submit to the same melody. They all sing the same words and they, they rally around the same truths, and that plants in their heart, and they go out from the assembly, from the formal service, with these truths combined with the melody of song on their hearts. That's why we say, like, man, the Lord has really put a song on my heart for you Monday through Saturday to walk closely with Him, to remember Him when you're doing the laundry, or when you're cleaning, or when you're driving to work. That's how to walk with God. That's a common grace of God that he gives us. Another one, the public reading of Scripture. Isn't that crazy? Paul tells Timothy again, be devoted to reading the Bible publicly without any commentating. So when we gather together, if you're wondering, how do I grow? I just want to walk with Jesus. One of the answers is, come to church. And listen to someone read the Bible without saying anything else. It's pretty novel, isn't it? It's not necessarily creative or like so epic, but it'll hold you fast to Jesus. Ezra did it in the Old Testament. He stood up. He read the scrolls. God's people stood for like all day. (laughs) Jesus actually started his ministry like that. Went to the synagogue, opened up the scroll, and he read Isaiah. And the Bible tells us to do that too. Why? Again, because there's something special. Not when we just read it individually in our homes, but when we come together and one person reads it for the congregation to hear. Two more. Public prayer. If you're wondering, how am I going to grow this year? This passage, Hebrews 10, is encouraging us to come together. Don't neglect it, as is the habit of some. But when we come together, let's be devoted to prayer. Again, something special happens when we pray together. This is more than just a text thread via our phones. This is when someone comes up and prays on behalf of God's people. We learn from how he or she prays. We we listen. We pick up phrases. We pick up how the Spirit is moving in that person, and it fits together with our concept of what God is doing in and through our church. We become more burdened for what that person is praying for than we were before. We We become more alive as we're listening and hearing God values, or we could just say simply, he really likes it when he is prayed to, when we talk to him together. So, just a quick conclusion, and then we'll do one more. To bring it back to Hebrews 10, when we consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds, it's like we can take these things, like public prayer, and the public reading of Scripture, and preaching, and singing, and we like put it all in a bowl, and somehow God uses it, like we stir it up. And the outcome of people's lives is two things in this verse, that you would love the Lord more, and that you would go from here on fire to 
do good deeds, not to earn your salvation. We've, we've all covered that, things like But to do good for the Lord, to live a life pleasing to him. And then, when that happens, it's not just a recipe that's equative, but these are things that cause God's people to not just come to a service and leave and go, oh, that was fine, or whatever, but to come and go from here, and then the church is not just a service, but it's the church sent on mission to love and perform good deeds. Amen? Hey, the last common grace that we'll talk about uh, is the common grace of communion. All of these components are meant not to just be an end in and of themselves, but they're a means to an end. Jesus said in John 5, hey, you pour over the scriptures thinking that in them alone they lead to eternal life, but they lead to me. And so together as a church, we're going to We're going to take the bread and the cup together, a common grace that is meant to sustain us, to hold us fast, that we would hold fast to our confession of faith. Before Jesus went to Calvary, he brought in his disciples and he said, hey, I want you to do something continually in remembrance of me. You're going to be forgetful, and so I'm going to give you two things that will help you remember my body, which was broken for you, And my blood, which was poured out for you. And so he passed around some bread. And he passed around some wine. And he said, I want you to take them. And in doing so, you're going to rehearse the gospel. You're going to remember me. And it's going to fuel you for living. And so we're going to do that this morning. Worship team, would you mind coming up? and begin to prepare our hearts. These are visual signs of remembrance for his church, not just to take him in ritual, but to remember him, to be grateful, to be sustained, to experience his presence. So let me pray. And then I'll guide us into our time of celebrating Jesus together. Father, you are good and your love endures. And you love your church way more than I ever could or do. And you have provided your church with your son, Jesus. You've given us tangible ways to walk with you. And Lord, we just, just like Amy prayed in the beginning, just like we've sang We've sat together. We've heard your desire for us to live unto you and for those who are far off. We've heard your desire to love one another and in so doing the world will know that you are the Lord. And so we we ask, would you help us? And so... We know that we are to examine ourselves before we, we take the bread and the cup. Would you wipe away, would you clean any unrighteousness that is among us? Would you, by your Holy Spirit, purge us from within anything that is not pleasing to you? We know that if we confess our sins to you, that you're faithful and just and you'll clean us from all unrighteousness. And so we do that now. And we celebrate how your son Jesus himself is going to sustain us moment by moment and day by day. We love you. So when you're ready, we're gonna take communion together if you didn't see on the way in, there's uh, some elements out in the lobby. You're free to stand up and take some if you didn't, if you didn't get it yet.
So let's take the bread out together. And I'll pray for us. So Lord, we thank you for your son's body that was broken for us. And as we remember him, we remember his great sacrifice for us on the cross. We say where love and justice meet. And we devote our lives to you. Lord, as we eat and celebrate the bread of life, we ask that you would continue to be faithful and sustain us this year. We need you. And we need you daily. So let's take the bread together in celebration of your body. Let's take the cup together. Let me pray for us before we drink. And so, Lord, we love your son, and we love the fact that his blood covers those who believe. We love the fact that in his blood we have victory and power. And so our banner that is over us is love, and we celebrate that lamb that was a great sacrifice for us. We're thankful. Lord, would your blood sustain us this year as we look to him. Cover us, wash us, make us clean. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's drink the cup together.